All right, good morning, everybody. Our text this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 16 through 18. Matthew 2, 16 through 18. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. This morning we begin a series of lessons on the doctrine of eschatology. The word eschatology is a combination of two Greek words. The noun eschaton, which refers to the end of something, like the consummation of an age. And then the verb logia, which means to speak about or to reason concerning. And thus eschatology is the study of or the speaking and reasoning about the end times, the end of history, the end of the world. Now, within 20th and 21st century conservative evangelicalism, there seems to be two postures assumed toward the Bible's teaching about the future. One is a posture of intense engagement, which sees the teaching as immensely relevant, as truth which situates one's being in the world and thus consciously guides his day-to-day decision-making. The other is a posture of decided indifference, relegating the teaching to matters of secondary importance worthy of only passing consideration. It is to this second group that I wish to address the remainder of my introduction, because while it is certainly the case that this subject is controversial and that various features of God's plan to reconcile all things to himself remain steeped in mystery, What can be known with confidence is that one's view of the future is not irrelevant to the present. Indeed, it is exceedingly relevant. As a thought experiment, consider the following two contrasting beliefs about the future. In the first, religion A believes that upon death, one takes his physical body with him into the afterlife, and hunts for food with it for all eternity. In such a view, one's flourishing in the world to come depends largely upon the condition of his body at death. And thus, if he was enfeebled at death, the afterlife would be a time of endless suffering. In contrast, religion B denies the existence of an afterlife altogether, (coughs) believing that when you are dead, you cease to exist. Now notice that in view A, it would be perfectly reasonable and even ethical, all things being equal, to take someone's life before he becomes enfeebled by old age. Indeed, it would be a very selfless act, being willing to kill your own loved one in order to ensure his flourishing in eternity. In religion B, however, such conduct would likely be considered evil and selfish because you would rob the person of the only chance that he has at flourishing. Now notice that even if religions A and B agree about the moral fact that murdering an innocent person is wrong, they differ dramatically on whether or not it's morally permissible, indeed required, to take a particular aging person's life, which tells us at least two things. Firstly, that our moral disputes are often not rooted in disagreements over moral facts, but rather non-moral facts. It's not whether it's wrong to murder a human being, but whether the fetus in the womb can be classified as such. DNA having answered that question from a scientific perspective once and for all. But the second thing that we learn from this little thought experiment is that one's non-moral beliefs about the future can have a significant impact upon which actions he takes, both moral and otherwise, in the present. 
And the same is true for one's view of the eschaton. In the past, we've discussed fundamentalism's shift towards what's called pietism in the late 19th and early 20th century, which is a growing indifference toward cultural formation, toward redeeming the nations for Christ. A view of soter soteriology or salvation, which while on the one hand tenaciously sought to transform individual souls, tended to turn its back upon societies. A laissez-faire approach to culture, vividly depicted in D.L. Moody's apocalyptic vision, in which he was reported to say, I look upon this world as a wrecked vessel. God gave me a lifeboat and said to me, Moody, save all you can. If the Chicago revivalist is right, if his escapist eschatology or view of the future holds, then whether a culture remains distinctly Christian or turns wholly pagan makes little difference to the cause of Christ. For if the world is a wrecked vessel that will soon lie at the bottom of the ocean, then any effort to redeem her is foolhardy. In fact, it may be sinful because it distracts from our commission to save lives. It's the confusing of politics or culture with the gospel. The point I'm making at the moment is that a pessimistic view of the future can have massive consequences for how one behaves in the present. Now compare this 20th century dystopic view, what we're gonna call in this study modern premillennialism. You compare that dystopic view with the utopic, or it's probably better to say the Edenic, the Eden-like view that came before it and dominated the late 18th and most of the 19th century American Protestantism. Now, I won't be using the word, probably I, I may use it if I'm speaking extemporaneously, but I try not to use the word utopian or utopia as a descriptor for this optimistic Christian view of the future because I think it's important, as we will discuss, that we distinguish it, what's going to be called post-millennialism, from the cult of progress which animates so much of modern secularism. In other words, there's a significant difference between secular views of progress and Christian ones. But during the 19th century, American Protestants believed that they li were living in a privileged time, that in fact the building of this new nation would usher in the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. It was a period of immense optimism where songs like the Battle Hymn of the Republic captured the exuberance of the colonists. My eyes, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. This is a song of gleaming optimism that this new Christian republic will not only be victorious over the present tyranny, but that this victory will usher in the millennium. John O'Sullivan's phrase for this mindset was manifest destiny, that the values of the United States of America, that of equal rights and freedom of conscience and personal enfranchisement, etc., would establish on earth the moral dignity and salvation of man, that this was our divine destiny, a time when righteousness would prevail in the affairs of men and nations, what Jonathan Edwards called the church's triumphant state, a time of true Sabbath rest. So post-millennialism teaches that the parousia, or the second coming of Christ, will take place after the millennium, post-millennial, right, after this period, of widespread peace and prosperity for the church. And it was this optimism that won the war for independence and drove American exceptionalism and tamed the Wild West and even fueled the 1850s abolitionist movement. In stark contrast, the pessimism of the 20th century seemed content to watch much of this progress be undone. And when consistency won out, cheered its regress, for it meant that the rapture would soon be upon it. 
Now, just as an aside, it is interesting to me that among woke Christian theologians, people like Randall Rouser and Gary DeMar, for them, modern premillennialism, the more pessimistic view, has fallen out of favor. For it's viewed as counterproductive to achieving the utopian visions of the social justice movement and environmental salvationism. It's just too pessimistic for the new gospel that they are preaching. So it seems to be that a movement is forming of woke post-millennialists. And the reason for that is because they've taken the stance of a reformer. And so they are in need of a more optimistic, optimistic eschatology, right? Because reformers don't say, make all these changes and things will get worse, right? Or even make all these changes and things will stay the same. But rather make these changes and it will you know, be where God's will comes on earth as it is in heaven. Physicians, in other words, need a positive prognosis to give force to their prescriptions. All of this to say that what you believe about the future will have a profound effect upon what you do in the present. And views drawn from er erroneous readings of prophetic literature can have terrible present consequences. Now, given what I've just said, perhaps you're thinking to yourself that the best strategy then is to retreat to a neutral position, to withhold judgment on such matters. For after all, they are quite controversial. But such a move is actually impossible, for you are facing what philosophers call a forced choice. You are going to have to live your life as if one of these views of the future is true. You don't have a choice. In fact, you are already doing so. And so it's not a matter of should I take a particular position or take a position, but what position have I already taken and is it consistent with what scripture teaches? And I would even say with what experience teaches. So I'm wondering if I have your attention at this point, if I sufficiently sold the necessity, the importance of this study. So this morning, what I want to do with the remainder of our time is to present what I'm calling four necessary presuppositions for the study of prophetic texts, which is to say four principles that should guide our interpretation of biblical prophecy. Because the sad reality is that many who engage in this kind of study never even consider such principles and are therefore in danger of basing their interpretations upon misunderstandings of the nature of inscripturated prophecy, which is to say prophecy that we find in texts. And thus, the need, I feel, to lay these out ahead of time before we get into the conversation uh, too deeply. If I don't lay them out now, we'll get into the conversation and they'll come up then. So it seems more efficient to lay them out in the beginning. These are the presuppositions, the assumptions, you might say, that will undergird our interpretation now, other people will have different presuppositions, right? And that's fine. In fact, everyone has presuppositions. I'm just laying them out on the table of head, ahead of time so that they are obvious to everyone and, and they know that that's what's governing my interpretation. Now, this particular list has been adapted in, in some significant ways from one created by theologian Jack Cottrell. The first presupposition for studying prophetic text is this, that the Old Testament was written ultimately for our sake. Now by our, I mean the church. As the Apostle Paul says in Romans 15, 4, the Hebrew Bible was written for our instruction. Meaning that in a profound sense, the Jewish nation was chosen by God to be the stewards of his oracles, preserving and protecting his holy writ until such time when the new and better Israel, the spiritual children of Abraham, to whom the Jewish nation itself pointed, could come and benefit from them fully. These things were written down for our instruction, says Paul. And he declares that this is true of whatever is written in these texts, right? Meaning the history that's recorded in them, or the poetry, or law, or typology, or doctrine, or of course, prophecy. Even the prophets themselves, if you look at 1 Peter 1, he tells us 
that even the prophets themselves did not fully grasp the meaning of these messages. But rather it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, meaning we who live in the era of the gospel of Christ. So these prophecies ultimately were not for those who heard them originally, or even for those who proclaimed them, but for us. A point which Paul reaffirms in 1 Corinthians 9.10 when he says plainly, yes, for our sake it was written. Now we should take just a second to appreciate the magnitude of this revelation. That the 39 books which make up the Old Testament, which have been faithfully passed down for thousands of years, all of that was done ultimately so that you could read these books, you, so that you could read them. Think about that for a moment. How many lives were sacrificed? How many fortunes were lost? How many nations were thwarted so that you could read these texts and reap their full reward? So that you might be liberated from your bondage to sin and return to your true vocation as ruling priest. So that God's will might at last be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the amazing conclusion of Hebrews chapter 11, the great chapter chronicling the heroes of faith. At the end, it speaks about all these people who have sacrificed everything, that they did so in order that we, now in the new covenant, might reap the full reward of what was promised. Those who made those sacrifices who came before us didn't receive what was promised. They were making all those sacrifices so that we, in this era, could receive those promises. This is one of the great privileges of the new covenant, having the veil pulled back so that we can behold the glory of God as shown in the face of the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament, of being able to read the Old Testament through the lens of the new, the kind of richness of perspective that comes when you watch a movie a second time Right, where you've, you know the ending of the story. You know where it's going. You can go back and, and see it in an entirely different way, in a way where that knowledge can really lead to a deeper understanding of what's taking place. This is a liberating vision that the messengers of old longed to witness and that we have a chance to partake in. This revelation also has implications for how we interpret prophetic texts. To give just one example, it means that the Hebrew Bible, but especially the prophetic texts, because they were written for our instruction, are going to be very gospel-centered, because that is the age in which we are living in, right? Or you might say that they're going to be very spirit-centered, because we are living in the age of the spirit. Or maybe you want to say they're going to be very Christocentric, because we are living under the reign of the Messiah, who is seated at the right hand of God. And this is indeed what we find. In, in prophesying, Peter says, if we go back to 1 Peter 1, in prophesying, these messengers were serving us, as we said, and then he says, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you, by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. So the prophets in the Old Testament were pointing to the good news that their king would return and reestablish his kingdom. Similarly, Jesus told two doubting disciples on the road to Emmaus, he said, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? This is shorthand for the gospel, the death of Christ, but also his exaltation, the resurrection, the ascension, the coronation of Christ, right? He's now reigning at the right hand of God, working to putting all of his enemies under his footstool. So this is shorthand of the gospel. And then the text says, the beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So the content of the instruction that we are to receive from the Old Testament is Christ. Jesus is the hero of the Old Testament. And thus Old Testament, Old Testament prophecies are about the coming Messiah and his future kingdom. They are Christo centric or gospel centered. In other words, they are not about odd 
and extraneous events. You know, people use these texts to predict almost anything. It just goes far afield. It loses the whole central thrust of what these prophecies are about. They are about God's plan for reconciling all things to himself. That should be our assumption when we approach these texts. Another presupposition that deals with Old Testament prophecies is this, that the New Testament should interpret the Old Testament. Now, the reverse of this is also true, right? The book of Revelation should be interpreted through the lens of the Old Testament. But Old Testament prophecies should be viewed through the lens of the New. And we've talked about this before. This is sometimes called reading the Old Testament backwards through the New Testament and reading the New Testament forwards through reading the Old Testament. And we do both of those things at the same time, the new informing the old, the old, old informing the new. And that can seem like it's circular, right? It's kind of like, well, which one are we giving priority to? Where does it begin? It's kind of a chicken and the egg thing. But instead of thinking of it as a, a circle, a more helpful way to think of it as a, is as a spiral, right? Where we're going down and down and we're getting closer and closer to the essence of the text. We're going deeper and deeper as the old informs the new and the new infor informs the old. Now, when it comes to the new and forming the old, it is regularly the case that the New Testament provides us the proper interpretation of the Old Testament prophecy. And that interpretation should obviously be given priority. For example, the very last Old Testament prophecy comes in Malachi 4.5. And it says, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And in Matthew's gospel, this is interpreted as being fulfilled in John the Baptist. In Matthew eleven fourteen, it says, and if you are willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. That seems quite straightforward, right? But then you'll start asking the question, okay, that, that, that makes sense, but what exactly is meant by the great and terrible day of the Lord? That's also mentioned there. A question which points us to the difficulty of using the new to interpret the old which is that not all Old Testament prophecies are interpreted for us in the new. Or the interpretations that we have aren't always entirely clear to us and what they mean. And a part of the challenge here is in determining a hermeneutical pattern from the interpretations which are provided for us so that we can interpret the ones which are not. That's what scholars have been doing for a long time. They look at, okay, well, how are the New Testament writers interpreting these Old Testament prophecies? What, you know, can we de decipher a pattern by which they are engaging in that kind of exegesis or hermeneutics, and then we can then, we can then apply it to other passages? It's a wonderful idea. It makes complete sense, but it just turns out to be rather difficult. And if you're an avid reader of the New Testament, you probably sensed this. And you should be an avid reader of the New Testament, obviously. Uh, but you've likely puzzled at the way in which inspired writers handle some of the Old Testament texts. For on occasion, they will cite or allude to a text in a way that seems to disregard the context of the original or even the meaning of the original Old Testament passage. One of the most notorious examples of this is found in Matthew's Gospel, where he cites the lament. This is the text that we began with. He cites the lament of Jeremiah 31, 15 to predict the destruction following Herod's infanticide, his killing of these male babies two years and under. And again, here's, here's, here's the statement concerning the fulfillment of, of that supposed prophecy or prediction. Matthew says, Then was fulfilled what was spoken of by the prophet Jeremiah, a voice was heard in Rama, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. The problem with this, of course, is that the, that the text in Jeremiah is not a prophecy. It doesn't have the, the typical signifiers of a future event or all the other pieces that you have for a prophecy. And as a result of that, there's been much skepticism. One scholar has referred to this Matthean passage as the New Testament's most striking case of disregard for original context. In other words, there are scholars who say the gospel writers are bad exegetes, particularly Matthew. He's constantly taking the Old Testament out of context to make it say what he wants it to say. 
But as scholar, Old Testament scholar Kyle Dunham points out, Matthew's use of Jeremiah 31.15 is actually much more nuanced than most people realize. For example, it seems to be the case that Jeremiah himself is using a well-known refrain here that was already in circulation, where Rachel's mourning serves as a poetic metaphor, a way to express public lament. It's kind of like what we would do is we might quote lyrics to a sad song that everyone knows when we are mourning about something. Everyone knows what that means. They get the idea behind it. Although what Jeremiah is doing is he's adding the location of Ramah. Ramah was the gathering point for the exiles that were going to be sent to Babylon from Judah in 587 BC. We read that in Jeremiah 41. And so the prophet, it seems, adopted these poetic lines to express a, a like sense of despair at these people having to leave to go to Babylon, to go into exile. As they're shipped out of Ramah, which is sort of this staging area, getting ready to go to Babylon, to go into exile. And since Rachel was the mother of Benjamin, it would also be fitting because those in Ramah, of course, were Benjamites. Right? So this is Rachel weeping over her descendants who are being sent into captivity. This is rich, poetic metaphor. The, I mean, it, in other words, it's not a flat-footed reading, right, where it's just one-dimensional. This is using this kind of lyrical language and rich history as a metaphor to express the kind of grief that the prophet is experiencing with these people going into exile. It, expressed in a way that, that really resonates with people saturated in the stories of the Old Testament. And thus, Matthew is just picking up on this. He's just following suit. He's expressing lament through poetic metaphor, again, over Herod's infanticide, right? His grief over it. These children who would also be the children of Rachel, right, as Jews. And so this is not inconsistent with the way that Matthew uses this kind of fulfillment language in the gospel. Again, part of the problem is it's a very modern way of, of approaching these ancient texts. And as time goes on and scholars learn more, we realize, wow, our view of the scriptures tends to be so modern. And that's where much of our criticism comes from. Now, the subject of the New Testament's use of the Old Testament is something I want to come back to in a future lesson, perhaps as part of a ser our series of defeater beliefs to Christianity, because it's a common one. Ben Shapiro, for example, who's an Orthodox Jew, cites the New Testament writer's odd use of the Old Testament as a reason why he is not a Christian. And as I said, I wonder if the reason for that is because Shapiro is taking too modern of a pr an approach to these ancient texts, taking modern hermeneutics and trying to read these texts with that lens in which they will always fail, right? You're using the wrong standard uh, by which to judge them or even the wrong lens in which to understand what it is that they're saying. But for our study of eschatology, we'll, we will mostly have to set that matter aside. But again, this presupposition is this. This is how we are generally going to move forward is to say that Old Testament prophecies are best understood through the New Testament, through the lens of the New Testament. The third presupposition is this. Prophetic language is typically figurative. To state that in the reverse, not all prophecy is intended to be interpreted literally. Some modern premillennialists interpret even the highly figurative language of the book of Revelation as literal. And I think that this is a grave mistake and that it really fails to appreciate the apocalyptic genre of this book. A genre which contains heavy symbolism and figurative language in its presentation. Hal Lindsey, who's a prominent modern premillennialist, has declared that really the real issue between other views and the premillennial viewpoint is whether prophecy should be interpreted literally or allegorically. Unfortunately, that's often um, presented in an unhelpful polemical way. Right? It's often presented to say, well, this is what the Bible says. If the Bible says that there's a beast and he has all these heads, then that's what, you know, the Bible means what it says. And so we should take it literally unless we have some, you know, real reason 
to say, no, this is, is figurative. As if to say that, you know, th that there isn't a distinction to be made between what the Bible says and what it means. As if the Bible doesn't teem in figurative language, right? Where it says that it's speaking about a beast with multiple heads, but if that's figurative language, then it's communicating truth to us, no doubt. But we, we have to take the next step of interpretation and say, what does it mean by what it says, which is an incredibly common way to interpret any text. But there seems to be this viewpoint that says, no, the literal reading is always the default when it comes to prophetic texts. And what I want to say is actually the opposite is true. Um, and thankfully, there are several places in Scripture where we are specifically told that the prophets tend to speak in figurative language. For example, in Numbers 12, 6 through 8, God contrasts the way that he speaks to Moses with the way that he speaks to most prophets. With Moses, he speaks mouth to mouth, he says, rather than in dreams or visions as he does with the ordinary prophets. With Moses, he speaks even openly and not in dark sayings or riddles. And so this seems to suggest that much poetic language, and I think if you study it and read it, you see that this is true, it's in the form of riddles meaning difficult speech that requires interpretation by that definition. That, in other words, Moses was the exception. This sort of plain speak that he has with Moses face to face is the exception to the rule in which, when God's communicating. Hosea 12.10 is a later affirmation of that same characteristic. It says, I have also spoken to the prophets, and I gave numerous visions and through the prophets, I gave parables, or the New King James translates that as symbols. And similarly, the first verse in the book of Revelation seems to announce the symbolic and figurative nature of the text to come, right? This is Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, uh, it says that Jesus signified the contents of this prophetic work uh, by his angel to John. It's the basic meaning of this word is to communicate through signs or symbols or figures. To signify is how it's translated in the King James, the New King James, and other translations. And in view of the contents of Revelation, as you just continue reading, this use of the word seems fitting. The point is that, is that the Bible itself describes the nature of prophetic language as parabolic or figurative, and thus we shouldn't insist that a literal reading be the default. As I said, I think it's the other way around. Let me just give you a few examples of how this is so obviously true. In Malachi 4.5, when God says that he's going to send Elijah, right? this name is surely being used figuratively and as a riddle. Like, what does that mean exactly? You know, it's not that Elijah is going to come, at, the actual Elijah is going to come back and point the way, or that's a possibility, but as we read and learn, we realize that it's not the case, that it's the actual Elijah. It's figurative, and it's a riddle that must have been, you know, they must have pondered, like, how is this going to come about? Or in Genesis 3.15, it prophesies that the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. Right? This is figurative language, and it's, it's steeped in mystery and riddle. What, you know, again, pondering how is that going to happen? And all these theories, as we talked about before, come up to try to explain it ahead of time, none of which ever get to the full sense of the glory of the truth when it's revealed with the coming of the Christ and the cross and his defeat of Satan and, and, and all of those things that take place at the end of time. Or when Exodus 17.6 says that the water came from the rock at Horeb and surely and then and Paul says, in interpreting that, he says that the rock was Christ in 1 Corinthians 10.4. Surely that's, you know, a, a figurative understanding of, of that particular text of how it would be fulfilled. So prophetic language is typically figurative. All right, one final presupposition is this. That prophecy can be fulfilled on different levels of reality. While the debate over biblical prophecy usually focuses upon the nature of its language, is it figurative or literal? That's where a lot of the debate lies. According to Cottrell, this is not really the key issue. A much more significant difference has to do with the nature of the reality with respect to which, with respect to which a particular prophecy is intended to be fulfilled. And what he means by that is when prophecies are fulfilled, it's fulfilled in reference to some reality, right? 
And what it turns out to be is that there's actually varying levels of reality in which these prophecies can be fulfilled. Now you might say, well, what would those varying realities be? Well, in scripture, one way those different realities are described, one way they're characterized, is to say that there are you know, ways <clears throat> that can be fulfilled physically and ways that can be fulfilled spiritually, right? And what t has tended to happen is among those who are prophetic literalists, who tend to default to a literal reading of all of these texts, they tend to also interpret all these prophecies ap as applying to physical realities rather than spiritual. There's almost a conflation that happens between the literal and the physical. These words are used seemingly interchangeably. When you think about it, when you say, was Jesus literally a door, right, or figuratively a door? What you're really saying there is, was he a physical door, right, or was he in some sense a spiritual door? Those two things can often map onto one another, but they don't always map on, okay? But it seems to be that if you take a very literal reading of these texts, then what's going to follow from that is that the, the fulfillment of these things is going to be, most of the time, physical. But a figurative prophecy can refer to a physical fulfillment. For example, go back to Ma Malachi 4.5, where it says that God's going to send Elijah. That's clearly figurative but the fulfillment of it is physical, right? And we could also show how it's a literal, or a literal prophecy, and yet it's, speared, it's, it's filled spiritually. And I, you know, we could complexify this ad infinitum. The point is that this distinction between the kind of language being used on the one hand, figurative or literal, and the type of fulfillment on the other, whether it's physical or spiritual, is important to maintain that distinction because often the communication breaks down because we fail to make that distinction. A second point is that the Bible often applies prophecy to the spiritual realm rather than the physical one, and in very important texts. Let me give you a few examples. <clears throat> like between two kinds of Israel in Romans chapter 9, Paul's talking about the physical descendants of Abraham and then the spiritual descendants of Abraham. There's two kinds of of Israel there, or two kinds of Jerusalem, a, a physical location or place, or the spiritual notion of Jerusalem. And, and what I would even say is, and then there is, a, there is a, there's a third reality beyond this, as we'll get into, which is the ultimate fulfillment of, of the, you know, the city of Jerusalem in the new heavens and the new earth. And so there, these prophecies, it's not necessarily the case that these have been fully fulfilled, right? There's still future elements to many of them. Or two kinds of kingdoms that Jesus speaks about in John 18, right? A kingdom of this world and, you know, a spiritual kind of kingdom. So that distinction is made in scripture over and over again when it comes to these prophecies. And so it has to be taken into consideration. The physical fulfillment, in other words, is not the default. I think we have to approach these texts with an open mind and determine which of the two makes the most sense. Okay, so there are the four presuppositions for our study of prophetic texts. And I may add to these as we go along, but these are central. These are the principles that will guide our interpretation of biblical prophecy. Again, the Old Testament was written ultimately for our own sake. Secondly, the New Testament should interpret the Old Testament and vice versa. Thirdly, prophetic language is typically figurative. And finally, prophecy can be fulfilled on different levels of reality. I look forward to our study together. I thank you for your kind attention.